Janelle Achebe is uh, from Biafra. He is a novelist. Some of his works have been A Man of the People, which is published by Doubleday at Anchor. He received the Margaret uh, Rung Prize for his first novel, which was Things it's Fall Apart. Apart. Right, and the Jack Campbell uh, News Statesman Award for for Arrow of God. Arrow of God, and then the Nigerian uh, National Trophy for... Uh, for No Longer at Ease, now in these, 1960. Right. Now, these are all novels that... Yes, yes, they're all no novels. When was the... Uh, when did you write the last one? The last one, um, The Man of the People, uh, was published first in London in 1966. Um, it coincided with the troubles, the beginning of the troubles in, in the Nigerian Federation with the first military um, coup that we had in January. And it was interesting because uh, the story itself was a story of the political corruption uh, in Nigeria. And um, I more or less said that this kind of thing might end with a military coup in the novel. So it was quite a close um, um, parallel. Now, of course, this is one of the contributions uh, of a writer as they write of their uh, own people and their own culture, isn't it? Yes, yes. I think if a writer is, um, a, a writer should have his uh, ears and you know close to the ground, as they say. And if if, if he's um, a, a member of society and he is a member of society, then what goes on is of primary importance to him. And uh, there may be moments when. Um, like in this case, uh, he finds himself uh, as a kind of prophet. Now, do you think that perhaps the novel form might have as much of an impact as, let's say, just a straight news release or an opinion uh, by a person written in a different form? Oh, it has more. It has more. I mean, far more. There's no comparison at all. Uh, we are talking about good novels right. now, yes. I mean, I think a good novel is worth thousands of tons of, uh, of uh, documentation. Um, because, you see, a writer should play all the keys at once. And, uh, and uh, therefore, if he, his vision, I think, is likely to be more rounded and therefore uh, more true. Now, can the... Uh Oh, but let you, let me say this: Do you, as a writer, not only try to uh, to portray the situation as it is with the various uh, people and cultures involved, as well as uh, try to find uh, a solution? Yes. Well, there are certain uh, levels of um, of this of, of trying to find a solution. Um, I, I think in a writer in this kind of situation uh, becomes a critic, a critic of society um, because he feels very strongly um, if things are not going very well. And therefore, uh, if he says, for instance, um, as I said, it is not right that those with whom we cooperated uh, to win independence, uh, which we placed so much hope, should now turn round and um, uh, misuse their position of authority, uh, their position of, of, of trust, then he's already making a concrete suggestion. I don't think it is my, my place to say this is the kind of government we want. I might feel, if I, if I, if I find that kind of solution, of course, I, I could say it, but I think it is enough. Uh, for me to say that this is not what we what, what we fought for, mm -hmm. uh, something is wrong. You see, and uh, draw people's attention to this. Now, how has the uh, conflict uh, affected you personally, and the pursuit of you? Your really, uh, in a sense, uh, desire to be uh, a writer. Well, um, the situation is a very very extreme one. Um, in terms, in, in, a, in a strictly limited physical sense, it has affected me in, in so many ways. I should be teaching, for instance, in the University of Biafra. 
Now, this university was one of the first victims of the war when the Nigerians moved in because it happened to be near the border uh, with uh, the Afro-Nigeria border. So they moved in there uh, quite early in the, in the war. And so the work there stopped. I mean, they not only moved in, they, they set the, the library on fire. Uh, so th that's one way in which it's affected me. I cannot make my classes. Um, uh, then I lived in Enugu, um, and one, my house uh, happened to be one of the first to be hit by a bomb. You see, and uh, a lot of my books and uh, documents and manuscripts and paintings were destroyed. Now, um, then thereafter, I have I have moved how many uh, three times, uh, you know, from place to place. So th this is this will give you an idea. I mean, I, I haven't suffered as much as as most, but uh, it's quite a lot, you know, to to have this kind of uh, um, uh, disorganization, and I just do not have the. The, the, the mind or the inclination or the kind of, of spaciousness which I need uh, for writing novels. I do need space and, uh, and peace and so on. And I find I cannot write any novels now. Um, so I'm doing other things. We're all fighting a war, so I'm fighting. Um, but I do find time to write poetry. Now this uh, is something new for you. This is something new for me. It seems to me to be the form uh, suited to this particular uh, circumstance. It is intense, it is brief, and um, it seems, uh, seems the right, the, the, the right um, form for the, for the time being. Now let me ask you this. Uh, is it of the form uh, and of meaning that it will be mean meaningful to all peoples of the world? Yes, well, I, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, I think, yes, I think, I think, um, I mean, I've been talking about um, the novel, for instance, as if it was merely uh, a social vehicle, I mean, it's a vehicle for social uh, reform and that kind of thing. It's that, but it's also a, a work of art. I mean, I'm assuming that we already have a good novel. We're only talking about what it's is additional. And um, a good novel should be of interest to readers anywhere in the world. Um, and this, uh, I, I feel fairly satisfied, for instance, with, with, with um, this limited success I have, I have had with, with, with uh, my uh, books. Um, for instance, apart from uh, publication in Britain and America, um, in other parts of the world, I mean, 19 foreign languages. So I think uh, if you are saying something of importance, then I think it should be of interest to people everywhere. Well, I think sometimes uh, there is uh, not uh, this understanding that actually if, if a novel is good or a poem is good, that it sh would be, of, in a sense, a universal identification. Because otherwise it would be, in a sense, just a chronological diary, yes, might not. Yes, 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 yes. It, it has to break out of this kind of uh, restricted... Area. It, is, it is located somewhere in time and space. It may be talking of a particular culture, uh, but uh, running through it, I think, must be, if it is any good, must be some overtones uh, that would um, sort of uh, strike a chord mm -hmm. in human hearts and minds everywhere. Now, as I said, in my mind, there is no doubt that, yes, you are a novelist of significance and that uh, your work uh, already has been acclaimed as being significant. The um, poetry uh, is partially a part of the new. What are some of the things that, let's say, that the strife were uh, stopped in the next month or two? What would you uh, foresee for yourself in uh, the things that, that you would want to write about them? Well, I haven't, um, I haven't worked out, um, say, the next subject or theme of a novel. I, but I know that I have learned quite a lot. My whole... Um, 
um, attitude to uh, the, the, the politics, for instance, the politics of Africa in relation to Europe. I mean, I've seen so much that is ugly. I mean, I mean, really, that has come out uh, during this conflict. I mean, so much humbug, so much hypocrisy, and so on. And um, this is bound to come out somewhere. In my own society itself, um, I have seen some good things, some excellent things. The, 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 the response of a people in an extreme situation, discovering themselves, um, this, this is something good. I wish we had more time to pursue it, but we do not. Our guest is Chana uh, Achebe, and he is from Biafra, and thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Friday is a very big day for our guest. She is Mrs. Mabel Iowa Robbins. She's president of the Iowa Retired Teachers Association. And the big day is the official dedication of Heather Manor. Now, what's Heather Manor first? And then tell me how it started. Well, many years ago, some of our good teachers had the idea that a retirement home for teachers was not only feasible, but very much needed. And uh, some of our teacher friends uh, thought they might help us. They were the Heathershaw sisters who lived out on Fleur Drive, and they gave three acres of land to, on which to build a retirement home for teachers. Well, of course, next thing that we ran into was the Federal Aviation Authority that said, no, you can't do this because it's right in the flight pattern of, from the uh, airport. Uh, the planes will fall down on you and uh, crush your home or they will make so much noise that the people can't sleep and so forth. So we had to look around for another place and then when we contacted the Urban Renewal Board and the uh, uh, ISEA executive board who was sponsoring this uh, project uh, made the deal with them to buy the present uh, place where Heather Manor is built. But because these sisters had given such an impetus to the project and sort of given us the nudge that put us over, we kept that name Heather, which was the first uh, part of their name, Heather Shaw. And we kept that name Heather and called it Heather Manor. I think it's rather a pretty name. I, I like it and uh, uh, it's a little unusual, not such a common name, but uh, not like, oh, Golden Age Home or uh, <laughs> Golden Years Home or Harvest Years or anything like that. You know, it's a little bit distinctive, and I like it. I think it's a wonderful name. There's something sort of romantic about yes, it, David. Yes, yes. Now, it's located at uh, East Fifth and Des Moines? Des Moines Streets, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right, right northwest of the Capitol. And, of course, as you come into Des Moines, from, particularly from the uh, west or southwest or northwest, there are two things that you can see. One's Heather Manor, and the other thing's the state capitol. And uh, the uh, Heather Manor just looms up over all the uh, surrounding landscape, and it is a beautiful building. It's just uh, unusually beautiful, we think. Now, are these apartments? Are they rooms? Or how does there, it? Well, there are three different sizes of apartments. There's the two-room apartment, which has a bedroom, which closes off. That's such as I have. Now, you were the first resident. I was the first person to go in there, and I nearly broke my neck to get in there first. I wanted to beat everybody to it. I uh, uh, knew my sister was coming in. I knew I could handle her and keep her out till I got in. But there was another girl from Colfax coming in, and I was scared to death for she'd get in before I did. But I got there first. I was the very first resident, and I was, uh, of course, very proud of that. I had selected my apartment the year before, so I knew where I was going to go, but I was glad to be the first resident. Then there are apartments which they call the medium-sized studio apartment. That's a one-room apartment. Mm -hmm. Then there is the smaller one, a few smaller ones, that uh, 
are perfectly adequate. They're not small, they're not little at all. They're perfectly adequate. They have all the same equipment that we have, closets, bath, private bath, all units have their own private bath. And uh, uh, everything, linen closet, everything like that, plenty of cross ventilation, even the smallest one has, so that if a person doesn't have quite the <coughs> Uh, funds to, to pay for the larger apartment, why he can go into one of the smaller ones. And there's large storage space in our uh, apartment, and uh, that's very handy, but of course the other storage spaces are in the basement. And there are laundry, laundry facilities in the basement, uh, everything that you would find in a first-class apartment home, only a little bit better. Now, is there a central eating spot? In yes, there is, yes. I've had three meals a day there uh, ever since the 29th of May when I moved in. And uh, my only complaint about the uh, <coughs> chef and his uh, cooking is the fact that he feeds us too much. And I have pled with him to cut down on the food. And I said, if I gain 40 pounds, my doctor will kill me. And uh, so you'll be to blame. So, but <laughs> he just cooks such wonderful meals. And uh, they're so well planned. And there's variety, great variety. And they're served attractively. And uh, we just are so happy there. We couldn't be happier. And, we are so glad we went there. Now, do teachers have a problem like uh, some other older people as far as eating is concerned? You mean as far as having a special diet or something of that sort is concerned? They have, uh, the chef can prepare them a special <coughs> diet because he's a man that's been in uh, restaurant work all his life. And uh, he knows about uh, prepare, uh, special diets and about preparing special diets so that he could do that if it were necessary. But uh, so far, everybody is husky, and uh, uh, there's one lady that at present has to have her meals taken to her in the room. But uh, as long as there are only a very few people in there, why, the uh, chef doesn't mind doing that. But of course, if it were full, he wouldn't have time to do that. And of course, the North Tower is all equipped with kitchenettes. That is a stove, electric stove, and a refrigerator, and a sink, and a big cupboard, and so forth. A garbage disposal in the service closet just outside the door so that these people who wish to cook for themselves can be uh, perfectly well taken care of. But um, uh, I didn't want to. I cooked and washed dishes all I was going to, and I wanted somebody else to, to do it for me. Well, now, part of it is the company of having somebody to eat with, and then yes. you do continue with good nutrition, don't yes. you? Yes. Oh, yes. Of course, my sister is in a, another two-room apartment just around the corner from me, and so uh, we go down together. They, uh, the people who cook for themselves, and we call them very facetiously cookies because they cook for themselves, but that's a nice sweet name too. Uh, they will come down occasionally, perhaps Sunday dinner or maybe for dinner regularly at, at the noon meal they'll come down uh, just to get one meal a day when somebody else prepares it and they uh, can have what they need. Now, is this restricted to just teachers? Oh, no, no, indeed it is not. We have some folks already in there who are not teachers. It's retired teachers and their friends. So all you have to do to get in is to say you're a friend of Mabel Ira Robbins and you could get in. <laughs> what happens if you happen to have uh, a teacher and you weren't very good when you were a little boy or girl well, and that? And well, most teachers are very forgiving souls, you will find, <laughs> and uh, they will forget all those uh, unpleasant things. And uh, they, they may say, yes, this is a good uh, person, and he should come in. Now, in uh, another vein, uh, are the uh, communities uh, taking uh, the full advantage of the talents of the teachers that are retired and making use of this within their community work? Pretty well. I think the smaller communities are more prone to do that than the larger communities. The smaller communities depend a very great deal on their retired teachers for substituting in the schools. And that's mm -hmm. a real problem. You know, substitutes are hard to get these days. And they're very delighted to have these retired teachers substituting. And then they depend on them to do a great deal of Red Cross work. And they depend on them to, they set up an auxiliary and say, here's the hospital auxiliary, join the hospital auxiliary. And they set this auxiliary up so that the retired teachers will join it and work in the hospitals, you know. Uh, take the books around from the, from the library, the bookmobile, and uh, take uh, the flowers around, deliver the flowers, deliver the mail, and things of that sort, you know. They, why, the hospitals just couldn't get along without these retired teachers. They just are so necessary to the community. 
Now, what about as uh, working as perhaps special tutors for some of the uh, children that really needed? Uh, they do that uh, a great deal. Uh, it's hard to get a child who has dropped out once to come back and be tutored. If they can get them before they drop out, Mm -hmm. and say, now we will help you take a teacher who is agile enough to get over to the school and meet the child after school. We'll tutor you for half an hour, three quarters of an hour, if you'll stay and we'll help you. Why they do that a very great deal. But when the child has already dropped out of school, it's just like pulling teeth to get them to come back for any kind of tutoring, though the teachers would be glad to do that. And retired teachers, uh, they don't have so much at stake, don't you know? Mm -hmm. And perhaps they're not so uptight as the classroom teacher and don't have so many worries during the day. And they're maybe a little more patient with these uh, cherubs that uh, need a little special help. And they don't have to worry about their position the next not day in, all, the, in their classroom. Their pensions are safe and their <laughs> social security is safe. And they just, if the mom and papa don't like it, why they can that doesn't make a difference to the retired teacher. <laughs> well, I know it's going to be a very special event uh, Friday at uh, Heather Manor, which is located at East 5th and Des Moines Street in Des Moines, Iowa. And our guest was the first resident. She is a Mrs. Mabel Iowa Robbins, the present president of the Iowa Retired Teachers Association. And thank you. Yes, it was my pleasure. If there is any question about the popularity of Wayne Newton, all you have to do is just look around us here. You can't see, but you may be able to hear him from time to time. The uh, girls basketball uh, from uh, Nevada and uh, Wayne Newton happens to be uh, very uh, much, as far as uh, his singing is concerned, a person that the older people enjoy too. Uh, Wayne, you don't just sing for the young people, do you? Well, no, ma'am. We have kind of been accused of being an anachronism, and if that be true, I would guess it, uh, it would come from the fact that we do primarily do songs that maybe the older people might enjoy in a new way and with new arrangements that, that maybe the younger people can enjoy. So we try to walk that very thin line mm -hmm. between the adults and the younger people and have enjoyed a modicum of success at it. Uh, would you be a, a bit more specific uh, as far as some of your background is concerned as the type of song and the type of musical background or the instrument background? As far as formal education in music, I've had none except for a year of uh, taking steel guitar lessons when I was six years old. <laughs> Otherwise, we have had a lot of practical education and experience mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in the respect that I started at the age of six years old in country and western music and we stayed in country and western music and I invariably use the editorial we because it also refers to my brother and my manager. Uh, we stayed in country music up until the Elvis Presley period <laughs> and I'm sure you remember that and uh, then I there was, that. you remember that, <laughs> then there was no demand for country singers uh -huh. and we went into uh, for a very short time in a period of doing rock and roll music mm -hmm. and then we opened in, uh, in Las Vegas in 1959 I was 16 years old, and uh, we had to do a variety of music because what happened is from doing one or two shows a week in Phoenix, Arizona, we were thrown into a schedule of doing six shows a night, six nights a week that went on for five years. Mm -hmm. So consequently, we had to develop different kinds of music and different techniques. So we did a little country, a little rock and roll, a few standards, bordered on, on maybe light classical and uh, Broadway tunes. So we had a bit of, of, of education in all of those fields. And I think probably that's pretty much what we do now is a wide variety of music rather than one particular type. Two questions. The first one uh, you can answer real quickly, I think. Where are you from originally? Originally, Roanoke, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And uh, secondly, wh what do you want to specialize in as you uh, become older? Well, as I look around, I kind of feel old right now. Uh, <laughs> 
As I get older, I, I think the, uh, I don't think there's a quick answer to that, so if I may elaborate, I think the time has come and gone that a singer can just stand and sing, mm -hmm. as the time has come and gone that a performer can just be a star in the United States. Uh, you have to do more things than just sing. You have to be a performer, for instance, and you have to strive to be an international star. Now, what this means is to embellish your career and try to take in possibly acting, if you're able to do it, uh, maybe a weekly television show or specials, records, nightclubs, uh, concerts, fair dates, and rodeos. If mm -hmm. you can do all those kind of things, then, of course, it's a little easier to achieve some kind of longevity. Now, what in your background have you done or are you doing now? Because now you have a special coming up. Yes, ma'am. And this is part of the entire background yes, as, uh, as far as preparation for where you're going in the future. We have very uh, definitely planned, rather than having it be accident, what we want to do in the future and taken concrete steps uh, in hopes that when the future comes and when those things are there that we have constantly hoped for, that we will be able to do it, such as motion pictures. I have done three or four or five uh, dramatic television shows, mm -hmm. which I've enjoyed immensely, and, uh, and I hope to do more. Uh, our special is certainly a prime example of what I'm talking about in the respect that the concept is called One More Time. Mm -hmm. And if I may mention the guest stars briefly, yes. I'll take a deep breath. <laughs> we have Tennessee Ernie Ford, Count Basie, Case Star, the Mills Brothers, Johnny Ray, Frankie Lane, Louis Belson, Louis Jordan, Charlie Barnett, Les Brown, and Paul Weston. Mm -hmm. Now, And I might add that this is would an Would you care ABC. to breathe now? <laughs> That's it. It is ABC. Right. And it's right in front of the Academy Awards. Right. And the whole premise of the show is to go back and recreate, we hope we have, some of the greatest moments in music with the people who made them great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it was uh, quite a quite a kick for me. I loved it. Now you're uh, you're doing records now. Yes, yes. ma'am. Mm -hmm. Now uh, does this? How long have you been doing big seller records? <laughs> well, it varies. <laughs> <laughs> what was the first one? Well, the first one was a, a tune called Heart, uh, that got into the top twenty across the nation, and then along came Donkey Shane, and then Red Roses, and then Apple Blossom Time, and Summer Wind, and so on down the line. But we have gotten into an area of recording also that is kind of unique in the respect that we probably sell more album records than single records. Usually what happens is you record a single, if it becomes a hit, then the album, it comes right out of the single. Now you're going to do an album. Do you record the, the single and the album at the same time? Not necessarily. And as a matter of fact, when you're proving yourself, as we had to on many occasions, you record a single record first because it's a lot cheaper for the record company to produ produce a single record than an album. And then once the single record becomes a hit, they will request that you go on and do an album. Then do you have to re-do uh, it to record for the album? No, ma'am. What they do is take the master off of the single and usually uh, title that for instance, Walking on New Grass mm -hmm. is the title of my brand new MGM album. There is a tune in there called Walking on New Grass. So what mm -hmm. you do is record probably 11 songs in an album, and you take what you think could possibly come out as a single or has been a single mm -hmm. and title the album after that. And so then uh, you can include in different albums, some of, uh, depending upon the title and the composition, different songs, and it may be a repeat sometimes of right. one from before. For instance, we, uh, we've done Don Kishin, I think, in three different albums, mm -hmm. uh, one being the title album from the tune. Secondly, I did a uh, Wayne Newton in-person album at the Crescendo a few years back, <coughs> and actually we do Don Kishin in our act, so it was repeated again. Same with Red Roses in those tunes. Well, Wayne, I want time for people to be able to put the voice with the name. This is Wayne Newton, and let's listen to a record from the new album, Walking on New Grass, by MGM. Great. <laughs> 